Uh, so welcome again to those of you who are here with us in person in the audience and people who are joining us virtually from across the globe, I understand. Uh, this is the panel which is provocatively called the state's rights, uh, which is basically another way of looking at the new activism of the states in the immigration policy making. There's a lot to cover here. Some of that got touched on in the state of play that Doris just finished talking about. And the idea is that some of those issues that got picked in the state of play, we will we'll dive into a little deeper. And to do this, I have really a star-studded panel. These are people who have studied this phenomenon from their vantage points uh, for a long time. Uh, and you have their bios in, in the program. I won't spell all of them except to highlight some things about, about their careers. Uh, on my immediate left is, um, uh, is Beatrice Ponce de Leon, Honorable Deputy Mayor of the City of Chicago. Our understanding is actually for the first time in our country that we have had a Deputy Mayor exclusively designated to migration issues, which not only tells you about her career, but also how our field has matured. Uh, she, was, she has been in this job in a difficult time, as we'll soon find out. And before that, she was in the state of Illinois. And so she has a state perspective on it too, and we're glad that you could join us today. Um, on her left, Isabel, Nunez, who is on his home front in DC. So you have a lot of fans here, I'm sure. He's the executive director of, uh, of uh, the Central American Resource Center, popularly called Caresson here in DC. Uh, but before Caresson, he was in Chicago. So the two of the cities that we'll be discussing at length today, he has had experience in both of them. Uh, on my right is uh, Miriam Jordan, who many of you may have spoken to when she calls you for interviews, is the national correspondent on immigration for the New York Times and has covered this stuff uh, from so many points of view, both abroad and here in the real lives of immigrants. Uh, before that, before she came to the Times, she was a correspondent both for Reuters and the Wall Street Journal, which gives her, I think, a really important perspective on this issue for a long time. And on the right of Miriam, and last but not least, is Mike Wishney, uh, who is uh, a William Douglas Clinical Professor of Law, considered by many to be one of the most influential legal clinicians in the country. I'm always amazed by how many of his protégés are sprinkled in all three branches of the government by now. Uh, he is probably one of the, I think the only person who has clerked for two Supreme Court judges, uh, but more important than anything, he is the one of the earliest non-resident fellows of MPI. So welcome, uh, welcome to all four of you. So we will do this in three distinct portions. Uh, one is what I like to call the busing chapter in our immigration history. Uh, the second will be uh, the rise of more punitive measures coming from states in the last two years. The third will be that look this this not look only at the at the negative things, positive things are happening at state and local communities, and we want to give space for that. And last is the sort of what is the state of federalism on immigration today? And as I said, these are four of the best people to deal with. So let's start. So let's go to the busing first, because we can't help it. This is what defined the last two years. We have never had this kind of targeted, dramatic, politically motivated uh, buses being sent from border states to the inner cities of the country for which they were not prepared. So let me start with ground reality. And I'm told nothing gets close to ground reality in the US than Chicago. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the deputy mayor, so tell me, how did you absorb the crisis first? And how did you deal with it, both politically and operationally? Well, good morning. And thank you for, for the invitation to be here. This is really a, an honor and a privilege to, to learn from 
from my colleagues and to be able to share some of the story of Chicago and of Illinois. So last August 31st is the first um, bus arrived in Chicago from Texas, sent by Governor Abbott. And at the time, the city had um, really quickly realized they did not have the infrastructure to absorb the folks that were coming in, be able to provide shelter and, and support folks on their journey. The state, and I was at the state at that moment um, at the Illinois Department of Human Services, stepped in and quickly worked to open shelters in hotels around the city. I think at a certain point we got to 11 hotels. And what came out of that work a year ago is that they developed sort of a new, a new model for how to support people who are arriving because we quickly saw it wasn't enough to just provide shelter, but people came with a wide range of needs. And Illinois has a program called the Illinois Welcoming Centers, which was funded to um, support 33, 34 nonprofit organizations that have flexible dollars to provide support for immigrants and refugees um, of all kinds, emergency housing, um, you know, help with education, transportation, whatever they need. And so we plugged in those Illinois Welcoming Centers we also had uh, shelter operators and we had state staff. But that that mission, um, we realized at a moment that we it wasn't sustainable. And so there was a, a decision to close those hotels. And what that opened was a path for resettlement. So again, the state rose to the occasion, our General Assembly, and allocated dollars for a state um, rental assistance program called ASRAP and a funding for Catholic Charities to do the housing case management. And we identified that there was also the need for people to actually help families move into apartments. So with basic furniture and moving. And that created this model of housing case management, moving support and rental assistance that has extended through what we're doing now. So Chicago is a welcoming city. We have an ordinance that makes us a welcoming city. Illinois is a welcoming state. And living out what that means has meant that we are collaborating as a city and a state and our county to welcome new arrivals in ways that we help meet their basic needs of food, shelter, some medical care, and then wrap around resources to put them on this path to resettlement. We have had now over 14,500 um, asylum seekers and other new arrivals come to Chicago in the just from January to now, um, I believe it was 144 buses have arrived. And from when the DNC was announced in Chicago, 132 of those 144 buses have arrived. That coincided as well with Title 42 changing and our new administration. So this new administration jumped in on the same weekend that Title 42 changed, and we've been going, going ever since. Uh, <clears throat> what we have developed is a parallel system to our, to our crisis shelter response. And if you just think about the capacity, so in our regular city shelters, we serve up to 3,000 people. We currently have 7,700 new arrivals in this new shelter system. There are 1,600 people in our police stations. Police stations used to be a place that if you couldn't find a shelter bed, you could go there for a night or two until a bed opened. But now they became a, a place for, for new arrivals who don't have... Um, a more typical shelter situation. That is not sustainable. And so we are at a moment where we are shifting the priorities, we're shifting our strategy. And number one is to replace those police stations with a different um, temporary shelter system over time to hasten the resettlement process so that people are in the shelter system for shorter periods of time and are on that path to have their own housing with the supports that the state is helping to provide. And then even in the longer term is looking at this as a um, kind of a planning effort in terms of how we create affordable housing and integrate immigrants into the city. I will pause there. There's much more to say. No, no, I, mean, I do I, want to share that that's that that's the situation on the ground in Chicago. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, the last point you made looked like that you decided that you're going to turn this moment of crisis into an opportunity. We have to. It is as we see. Imagine fourteen thousand, fourteen thousand to fifteen thousand people um, coming to Chicago. 
our goal is to help them resettle in the area, just like so many other immigrants have. And so we know that we need to move beyond this crisis response to think about how we integrate immigrants from a planning, city planning perspective, working to revitalize our neighborhoods. Um, we're also in dialogue with our neighboring suburbs and working with them to think about ways that they can be host communities for resettlement. Several of them have stepped up, are interested. We're trying to you know, negotiate that. Um, and, and I would say that as we provide these services, it is a moment also to strengthen the infrastructure of the city because we may see climate refugees. The Great Lakes are, are a safer place in the country in some ways. We might see other people coming to our city and the city has to be ready to respond. So I'm seeing that there's a, a future where we are building a stronger infrastructure with multiple levels of government involved. Um, and we are also developing a better system of care because what we're learning in providing services for this particular group of um, new arrivals is that we can also build off of that to improve our shelter system and permanent supportive housing for other people who are unhoused throughout Chicago. So ultimately, we'd like that those two sheltering systems to merge mm -hmm. and really just become a stronger um, crisis response, permanent supporting housing system for anyone in Chicago that, that needs that work. Great. So, Abel, I'm not sure that Governor Abbott had D.C. in mind if the vice president didn't live here and <laughs> wanted to send buses to her home. And that happened in an obviously dramatic way. Just tell us, uh, what did you do when that happened and what lessons have you learned from that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, again, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I, I would start with this. Uh, I think the intention is... Uh, uh, from the governors that they would not be able to accommodate them. They will not want them and they would uh, expose their hypocrisy. That was the intention of the segre segregationists in 1962 when they sent African-Americans and buses to Northern cities. So this is not new, mm -hmm. um, uh, but what do we do? We, we responded, you know, on uh, April 1st, uh, Governor Abbott makes an announcement that he was gonna send immigrants mm -hmm. to the doorsteps of Biden because he was in disagreement with his policy. And to his word, April 15th, the first bus arrived. And so we responded uh, as we do. So uh, organizations got together and said, we need to provide just the basic services. At that time, most of the people that were coming in the buses were, were not making Washington DC their home. They were still looking to move ahead. So our role was to, to get them some food, get them some shelter and in the context, people had just been released maybe a day or two from Border Patrol, got on those buses for about 30 hours and then reached our city. And so uh, we did it. We had no infrastructure, uh, as Beatriz has pointed out in Chicago either, because we were not a, a, a border city, but we tried to, to just provide, you know, a helping hand, uh, a warm meal, and then assistance to where they uh, finally want to go. Uh, and we thought we were going to do this for 15 days. We thought it was going to be something that Abbott was going to claim victory, and then we were going to move on. And unfortunately, he kept sending buses. And so we had to develop the infrastructure, want to receive the immigrants, process them uh, you know, quickly, and then get them to what, where they wanted to go. But we also then began to deal with the fact that about 10 to 20% actually wanted to make DC their home. And that... Um, which Beatriz has mentioned is what was the hard part. It's, it's, it's one thing when you're a pass-through city, there's another thing when you're the actual final destination because it creates a whole host of other issues. And mind you, I would say this, that we were receiving immigrants at Union Station while there was a tent city mm. at Union Station. Mm. So our inability to house people, period, mm -hmm makes it a harder challenge for us to then get this immigrants. The fact that they didn't have any work authorizations, they were legal in the country, but they didn't have any work authorizations, makes it difficult for the city. And so our role has been to really build up infrastructure to get them uh, you know, connected with immigration services, uh, 
caseworkers to help them access the services that they can that are available to them, uh, you know, to do it. And we work with the city here in Washington, D.C. to create the Office of Migrant Services. Um, you know, but D.C. Is a, is a strange place where you have multiple jurisdictions. You have a federal district, two states, multiple counties. And so we have to negotiate with multiple partners to make sure to create the the easiest path, if, if, if there's a word for that, for immigrants to, to then integrate into our city, because most of them want to work, they want to be independent, um, but they are, th th there is there is really a difference of expectations of what they think they're going to get the moment they cross the border, because most of them have been done in an, an arduous journey that 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 it, it, it just really breaks your heart when you hear some of those stories. Uh, but at, but at the end of the day, they, they sometimes think that once they made it after the border, they're on easy street. And we have to kind of tell them, no, the journey continues. We need to work together because we need to build that infrastructure. So our role has been to build infrastructure to make sure that we can receive them the best uh, way we can, uh, we can. And it's a work in progress. We're not where we want to be, but we're definitely better off than we were when the buses first started coming here. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you made a distinction between a transit city and the city of destination. So you kind of had to play the role. I understand that you made a, a welcoming thing, something called USA 101. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that? That, that we created here, we noticed that there was a lot of immigrants like Many immigrants, I was an immigrant myself from El Salvador. You you have an expectation of what the U.S. and there's a reality with the U.S. So we created a, a document called Living in the U.S. to give people like a, you know, basic one-on-one of what it is to be. I mean, things such as smoking, you know, don't leave your kids unattended. You know, those, those, those are simple things that people may not think about, but they can really have implications uh, uh, while living here and trying to integrate, which usually is, is done by your family who receives you, right? Or your community who receives you. But in the absence of that, we felt that we needed to, uh, to do that. And so part of that is just letting immigrants know, okay, whatever you know about the U.S., it's not the entirety. It's probably 1% of what you really need to know to integrate. So this is a document that helps them. And we, it's it's downloadable. Uh, it's, it's an MP3 file. It's a YouTube video. And it's not meant to take on every issue that you need to know, but at least start. Mm -hmm. So Miriam, let me turn to you. I mean, as a national correspondent, you have the ability to smell a story before it happens. <laughs> uh, so how did you start seeing this new chapter unfold, uh, both even before people arrived here and then when they came. Right. So, yes, I indeed, I spend, I think, at least half of my time on the border um, these days. And a few years ago, I started to see the world come to the United States. I think there was some reference to how we mainly saw Mexicans. And then like in 2012, 13, 14, we had this... Uh, you know, arrival in large numbers of Central Americans, particularly families fleeing violence. Um, I thought my job was going to get repetitive. I'm sure others here, like Julia, who have so much experience, might not even have foreseen this. But, you know, I was, I never expected to see the world at the doorstep of America as I began to see a few years ago. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, Russians, Indians, Chinese, um, you know, more recently Afghans, and of course, Venezuelans. And I think that we cannot repeat enough how big this wave from Venezuela is, how unprecedented it is, and how it has been a huge and major factor in the crisis, if we can call it that, that has arrived to cities like New York and Chicago. Um, Venezuelans have no family ties by and large here. They have no um, they, have, they have no friends where they could like spend a few nights on the couch or on the floor. Um, I've met mothers, you know, single mothers with 
children, one with four children who said she had to get out of Venezuela. She couldn't feed these kids anymore. And she was going to California. She didn't even realize that California was a state. She thought it was a city. I mean, they are so desperate. And I meet people all the time in the on the border from Venezuela who don't even know where they're going. So when these buses, um, you know, became available, they they love this opportunity. And most of them tell me that they're extremely grateful for it. And more and more advocates are telling me the same thing after initially saying that this was horrific and that these people were pawns in a political chess game. I mean, the fact of the matter is that many of these Venezuelans, by the time they arrive um, at the border, have nothing left. Um, if they had anything, um, they were robbed along the way. Many of them tell me that the journey through Mexico was worse than through the Darien Gap. Mm -hmm. And so when they're presented with this opportunity to board a bus, they take it. Now, what has happened is that as more of them have arrived in cities like New York and Chicago, they've told their friends who are on the way that if they come to New York, they will get shelter. If they come to Chicago, they will get help. And that's kind of snowballed. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about Venezuelans is that the ones I've met by and large are urban folks. It's not like they're campesinos. They're not, you know, they're not, they weren't working on a farm. They are not from like the highlands of Guatemala. They're not going to bypass big cities. Like we've since the nineties, you know, many immigrants have bypassed big cities and gone to work, you know, on, on chicken um, farms in uh, in in Alabama, in Georgia, they've gone to Iowa. These folks want to go to big cities. That's where they've come from. And that's another factor that I think is contributing to this um, wave um, into the cities. But having said that, it's not just Chicago and New York. I mean, there are people, they're going to Denver, they're going to Las Vegas, they're going to Salt Lake City, they're going everywhere. And they arrive with nothing and they need help. And this is unprecedented because undocumented immigrants who arrived in the millions in the past didn't want to seek help from authorities. They wanted nothing to do with authorities. They wanted to go straight to work construction in Atlanta or they were going to go to Alabama to work where their cousin had a job on a, you know, chicken plant line. Um, these folks, they're kind of operating in the dark. They don't have friends. They don't have family, as I've said. No, that's very helpful. I mean, I think a lot of people argue that since this group of immigrants actually were screened by government officials at the border, they felt many more comfortable actually seeking help from government downstream. So this is obviously a very interesting new development. So Mike, let me just turn to you as uh, you have a reputation of making your students push envelopes. Uh, <laughs> so what theories are you developing for dealing with this new flow of people? Moves, you're supposed to lower the expectations, not raise <laughs> the expectations. And um, I know that as soon as I leave, I need to go update my resume to make sure the non-resident scholar is right at the top of yeah. MPI. Um, well, thank you. And it's it's great to be here and hear all of this um, uh, work and thinking that's going on in the prior panel and this one and what's to come. Um, so um, in the... Um, Period after the first need, the the first set of needs when people arrived were urgent uh, needs for shelter, food, medical care, and so forth. But we're past that those first days that you were just talking about um, in many places. And um, as people begin to make decisions about where they want to uh, to settle. Um, more and more, at least in New York, and and we have experts that I, expertise on Chicago and DC and elsewhere. The call has gone out for work. That people, at least in New York, the, the one of the central demands has been allow people to work. People want to work. Employers want to hire them. Let people work. And um, on that score. I have to say I'm skeptical when I hear people, including the assistant secretary earlier today, say our hands are tied, the laws prohibit us, there's nothing we can do. Um, often politics prohibits things, resources might prohibit things, 
but law is pretty indeterminate. And there's often a lot more play in the joints than policymakers want to acknowledge. So I have to say I'm skeptical when I hear people say, I really wish we could help people work. We just can't. The law doesn't allow it. Um, and so as we move into this next period, I think um, focusing more and more on allowing people who want to work and can work to do so becomes more central. So um, first of all, on the federal side, uh, you already heard, of course, the suggestion made by many to use TPS much more aggressively, um, which will bring with it much more immediate access to employment authorization. But I want to go a step farther. Um, it was controversial, of course, but after Katrina, many will remember that President Bush suspended enforcement of employer sanctions for a period of time. It was not Bush. The Department of Homeland Security announced that it would not enforce the employer sanctions against employers hiring people during the initial reconstruction period. I think the initial period was 45 days, but there was nothing magical about 45 days. Employer sanctions, of course, are the statute that prohibits the employment of unauthorized migrants. So that has happened before, and it could happen again. Um, and in fact, in recent years, the Supreme Court has made increasingly clear, and there was reference earlier to Judge Hanen's decision as well, that even this court sees a significant difference between non-enforcement or prosecutors not enforcing laws on the one hand versus conferring benefits on the other hand. And in the DACA decision in Regents and the more recent decision in U.S. against Texas, uh, that one by Justice Kavanaugh instead of Chief Justice Roberts, a majority of the court has said there is broad discretion to decide when to enforce particular laws against people and when not to. And you can't even come into court for that. So I think that there's, and that was exactly Judge Hanen's reasoning um, in saying that DACA is going to be invalidated for the third or fourth time, he said, um, because it went beyond non-enforcement to confer benefits. I think that the Secretary of Homeland Security could tomorrow, with a stroke of his pen, say for a period of time, we are going to suspend enforcement of the employer sanctions provisions in New York City or New York State or Chicago or Illinois. Or maybe he says, Governor Abbott, you seem to have a lot of people in Texas. Why don't we suspend it in Texas? Let people work in Texas, too, or in Tallahassee. That would be for others to sort out. Um, but President Bush pointed to the particular needs and the time limited uh, exercise of uh, helping Katrina. And I think that for the federal government to say there's nothing we can do to further employment um, opportunities beyond the the six month delay for asylum seekers and not everyone is even going to pursue asylum or is necessarily eligible for asylum and so forth. There's a lot more that could be done. There are some things on the state side, uh, state and local side as well, however. Um, and uh, again, I cannot all speak to Chicago or Washington. Uh, we have a lot of expertise here, far beyond what I would know. Um, but uh, there are a lot of forms of labor that do not constitute employment, um, but constitute independent contractor relationships in which there's no prohibition on working because it's not working for an employer. And I think that state and local governments could potentially, in their own context, be more proactive in supporting labor in independent contractor circumstances. So some famous examples in New York City are street vendors, taxi drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers. Um, these are not the only forms of independent contractor work, not just gig economy jobs. But there are probably a lot of situations in which local governments could lawfully help people get to work without violating the employer sanctions laws, whether Homeland Security suspends their enforcement or not, simply by facilitating their ability to pursue labor in settings that are recognized and long have been recognized as not implicating an employer employment relationship. Um, and I don't know whether there have been any initiatives to help those who are here who have skills or have an interest in working in such situations um, to begin to do so, at least in the temporary period until hopefully work authorization comes through. Finally, and most ambitiously, um, many people in this room probably know about the organizing that's been underway in California to persuade the University of California system to hire unauthorized workers. And this proceeds on a legal analysis, which I've signed my name to and so have many others, that holds that the employer sanctions law does not apply to the states. 
there's a whole set of decisions about whether employment laws like Title VII and other ones apply to the states. In fact, many of them, including Title VII, the minimum wage and overtime laws, when initially enacted, did not apply to the states. Um, and because of the 11th Amendment, in fact, you can't apply a federal law to the states without a clear statement or sort of explicit statement that that is the intent of Congress so as to override the 11th Amendment. Well, notably, Congress later amended Title VII, amended the Fair Labor Standards Act and others to make them explicitly apply to people who worked for states so as to overcome amendment the 11th Amendment, but that's never happened with employer sanctions. So in California, um, the argument is that the employer sanctions law doesn't mention states under the 11th Amendment, therefore the state of California can lawfully hire undocumented workers because it is not subject to the employer sanctions laws. Um, and there is robust organizing and legal work underway. I personally think that analysis is correct. So that won't help cities, um, but in a city like Chicago and a state like Illinois, could potentially work with the state to test this out um, and start hiring people without work authorization and see if the Biden administration prosecutes. I, I promise you, I promise you there are Twitter feed is like a lie that Professor Vishnu has suggested that employee sanctions be suspended and states hire all unauthorized people. Uh, but that's what you get for getting smart people like Mike to come and ask us to, to test our limits. Uh, listen, we could go on busing for a long time, uh, but let me just shift uh, to other, other issues. And uh, Florida made news this year, in, in my estimation, to now enact the most ambitious anti-immigrant omnibus uh, legislation in any state. I mean, states have been inching up to this for the last 15 years, but to me, this crossed a barrier. So Miriam, you wrote a very long story on that. Uh, <laughs> just tell us what happened in Florida and what ripple effect has that had on people? All right, sure. So to quickly summarize um, the law, I won't go into all the elements, but some of the main elements that make it so sweeping, um, it mandates hospitals that accept Medicaid to report um, to the state how much um, they're spending on undocumented immigrants, which of course means that they are to ask immigrants uh, uh, their legal or their immigration status, um, whether they're in the country legally or not, um, when they're admitted. Um, that, of course, is making immigrants freak out or, I mean, intimidating them and inhibiting them already from seeking care, I've heard. Um, the law invalidates driver's license from several um, states that issue driver's license to undocumented immigrants. Um, it criminalizes punishable um, with a 15-year prison sentence crossing into Florida or transporting undocumented immigrants. And um, right after or shortly after the law um, was signed by Governor DeSantis, who you know touted it as the most ambitious um, anti-immigration law or immigration law ever. Um, I set out to, to speak with some employers about what effects they were seeing on the ground. And of course, it, it was still a little early to like, and it still is currently early to measure sort of a, a economic impact on the state. I was most shocked that I couldn't get chambers of commerce, big companies, small companies to talk to me. They literally told me they did not want to touch this issue, which which seems to underscore, you know, the gravitas that DeSantis has and how afraid they are of this, I guess, popular, popular governor who is, you know, a contender to the White House. But the employers who did speak with me in the construction, agriculture, and service sectors told me that they had already lost workers, um, that rates for some of the jobs had already increased, and that um, you know projects were either slowing down or were obviously getting more expensive because they weren't able to hire the crew. Um, there's a big roofing company in Northern Florida, I won't cite the name, and uh, the head of that told me that um, 
he had a very large project and a contractor who had been extremely excited to bring his crew in to work on and then called like three days later after they'd agreed and said, I'm really sorry, but my workers, you know, who do jobs, um, work on projects in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina as well, do not want to go to Florida. And I've heard that from many other folks in construction. Um, one subcontractor said he lost half of his crew, but I think it's still a fluid situation. But recently what really crystallized the impact to me was after the latest hurricane. Um, I set out to interview um, undocumented workers who by and large have been crucial to recovery work after hurricanes. And one after the other told me that, you know, he or she would not be returning to Florida because of this law. And several of them told me that they had been working in the Fort Myers area for several months after Hurricane Ian and that they were there when the law passed and they felt that they were being more harassed, that the law enforcement sheriff's deputies were becoming emboldened um, by this law to follow them or, you know, not turn them over to ICE per se, but to harass them, tell them, I don't want to cross paths with you again, get out of here. I spoke to two um, workers who literally decided to leave with their crews. Um, so, I, I sense that there's an impact. I can't, you know, I can't be sure. Yeah. But I understand, uh, Abel and, um, and Beatrice, you've seen some impact of the Florida law, even in uh, places that you have been observing. Tell us from your perspective. Well, I mean, the laws are, are not practical, but they do, what they do send us a chilling effect, right? Um, across the, the, the country. Um, I think Georgia is thankful for that law because they're getting a lot of a new workforce. Uh, but but the reality is that our you know our future is tied to immigrants and the labor that, that they bring. Unfortunately, we, we're running into you know what the previous panel talked about cultural issues, and what I would like to also bring up race issues. I think if we were ha having a huge influx of of Nordic. Uh, Immigrants, I think uh, the, the treatment will be a little bit different. Uh, and I'm saying that because former President Trump basically said that. <laughs> and I don't think it was his personal belief. I think he was just reflecting the belief of a lot of the people. And I think demographics is our future and we are turning into a browner country. And that scares the dominant culture. And, you know, the, the culture wars will get worse and we will tolerate loss of this nature. That hurts us hurts the economy. I mean, you go talk to any construction company and they are, before all of this, they couldn't hire anyone. Uh, now it's even worse. And, and we have things like public charge and all of those things add up. The, the fact that in the census, they want to ask the citizens some questions. Now, what's that related to, to this law in, in Florida? Is the fact that the, the, there is a sense that we are not wanted here. And, and it permeates. So someone just has to kind of mention it and people say, I need to get out of here because now I'm putting my life, my children's future in danger. And I, and I think that this will just grow. Um, and yes, we have little islands like Chicago is an amazing <laughs> place, Los Angeles, New York, but but you're seeing the the, the rifts that, that, that are happening there. So I think that, you know, at some point this, this will come to a head and our country will be hurt by it. So how do you see this Florida kind of stuff having ripple effects in, in Chicago. Well, anecdotally, I do know that people <clears throat> are concerned and they can't believe it because Chicago is such the opposite, right? We, act, we have a city key program that is a government issued ID that we give to anyone who needs it. They don't have to have any type of immigration status for it. It becomes, you know, it's a library card, a transit card. You can even get a prescription discount with that city key. Um, and as people think about, we have seen population move to Florida from Chicago, I think over the past you know several years, whether lower taxes for, for these benefits, but for the immigrant community, um, they, they don't think of Florida as a friendly place. So I think that in, in that regard, um, 
people will will choose Chicago. But in terms of seeing a ripple effect of folks coming into the city, what we are seeing is not only people that are being sent on the buses, but now higher numbers at at the airports. So for a while we and they're coming from different states, but primarily still from Texas. Um, but I, I'm curious to see if we will see more more folks coming in from Florida to Chicago um, through O'Hare and through Midway. And I, I wanted to comment on the work authorization work because our governor, mayor, and and several of our elected you know federal delegate delegation, as well as ABIC and IBIC, just recently called for a state um, work authors temporary work authorization program using making the case of a significant public benefit, but it is in the hands of DHS to approve, and it is one of those ways that potentially, as a state, we can um, begin to test some of these ways of, of operating. So I'd like to talk to you more about that other possibility. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is a special time in Illinois and in Chicago. And although the numbers are getting more challenging, we are trying to approach it in a in a way of um, opportunity and find ways to to welcome our new neighbors differently. Yep. But he has no reporting on this. Yeah, so I, I must say that um, you are getting Flo Floridians, I mean, um, immigrants from Florida, because when I was last there reporting, I heard from several of them that they were going to Cidades Sanctuarias, which I had never heard immigrants actually refer to in that manner before. But they specifically cited Chicago. And I interviewed several people who were on their way to Maryland. Um, yeah. Thank you. Interesting. So, Mike, so is this, I mean, you followed federalism and state was, is this the new high watermark of state assertion? Well, it's, it's hard to know. Um, the brief history is that for the first hundred years of our country, almost all immigration policy making happened at the state and local level, as people like Jerry Newman have documented. And the dispute over slavery largely prohibited Congress from regulating immigration. So actually, for the first hundred years of this country, immigration rules were set almost entirely at the state and local level. After the Civil War, Congress began legislating on immigration robustly for the first time. And by the late uh, 19th century, that was becoming more and more extensive. So in a way, for the next hundred years, there was this notion of federal supremacy, that immigration was exclusively federal, um, and that the states and cities had no role whatsoever in immigration. And of course, it is true under the Constitution that federal law trumps state or local law. So if there is a conflict, federal law does trump. But I think the last couple of decades have unsettled that conventional wisdom further, and there's been an enormous amount of activity by states state, county, local governments, um, not just regulations that impact immigrants and other residents too, of course, but there's actually specifically contemplating immigrant residents in their jurisdictions. And for most of that period, I think much of the activity was welcoming and inclusive um, uh, efforts, not exclusively, of course, but, but predominantly. That's what's, I think, changed a bit in the last couple of years. And we're seeing much harsher and more extensive efforts by states to target, to punish, to, to uh, inflict pain and suffering on immigrant communities. And of course, there's no such thing as immigrant communities. We all know households are mixed, neighborhoods are mixed, schools and churches are mixed. So it's not just pain on immigrants, it's pain on immigrants and everyone with whom immigrants live, love, uh, worship, and so forth. Um, but I don't know whether it's it's over. Uh, it may be that because Congress has been constipated, as uh, Angie said earlier, for you know from doing major immigration updating and modernizing, let alone overhauling since 1996, arguably that in that vacuum, um, our federal laws are creakier and less and less appropriate to the circumstances if they ever were. Um, and in that vacuum, states and localities have had no choice but to try to manage their schools and their cities and their transportation systems and all of that and have stepped in. That said, it also seems that we are in this particular moment where not only on immigration, but on abortion laws, on gun laws, states uh, are going in very different directions, um, increasingly harsh, uh, certainly on abortion. 
and they're trying to extend their influence over state lines. So to me, the Florida driver's license piece, which I feel like they're picking on Connecticut, we're one of those five mm -hmm. states, you know, all those millions and millions of Connecticut licensed drivers in Florida are in such trouble now. Um, we're proud that our driver's licenses are available without regard to immigration status. Um, I don't know how meaningful it is that you can't take a Connecticut license to Florida, but that's an effort to project your rules elsewhere. And that is different. So remember in the marriage equality fights, when some states didn't want to recognize the marriage licenses issued in other states to same-sex couples. And there was a question about whether under the full faith and credit clause and other laws, one state had to recognize the licenses duly issued by another state or not. Um, on the abortion side, uh, Texas, I think, was one of the first states to say, not only are we going to prohibit access to abortion in all kinds of circumstances, but we're going to try to impose penalties on anyone outside Texas who provides abortion services to a Texas resident who might cross a border to seek an abortion or help someone cross the border to seek an abortion. And so Connecticut, in response, said... Uh, passed a law that says any state that tries to impose liability on a Connecticut driver or a provider or doctor or nurse or anything like that can be sued essentially for all that and more. So you can sue back and forth at each other, right? So Texas says, if you go to Connecticut and have an abortion, you can sue the doctor in Connecticut. And Connecticut now says, if you get sued in Texas, you can sue back for all of that, plus everything, all this other stuff. That feels a little different. Um, and the idea that Florida is trying to tell Connecticut how to operate its licenses or what it'll recognize or not feels a little bit more like the um, efforts to impose wills across state lines. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know where that goes, but as long as Congress remains, you know, absent on the field on immigration, there are going to be these struggles. Right. So as long as Congress leaves this vacuum, some states and localities have started doing their own positive things. Yeah. So I understand that Illinois actually just last week mm -hmm. passed a law allowing foreign medical graduates to yeah. go straight to licensing of their... Uh... So tell us what, from your perspective, what positive things are happening in states or localities? Well, I can go back to Illinois in terms of, um, I think as a state, we are also a welcoming state. The Trust Act created that and you see it. So we have this Illinois Welcoming Centers. It's it's a significant investment in nonprofits to support those um, organizations. Chicago now has a welcoming center connected to each shelter. We have um, a healthcare law that allows un undocumented people to access public um, health insurance. And so that that is a significant move. Our driver's license also do not take immigration status. As So in terms of Illinois, I think we have created a, a climate there that is, that is welcoming, that is positive. And in collaboration with the city, um, which is also significant. There's so much alignment right now with the Pritzker administration and the and the Brandon Johnson administration in terms of how we are navigating this um, this moment. Which you know we've moved from calling it a humanitarian crisis to a humanitarian endeavor because it's not just a moment, a crisis, but it really is a new reality. And as we look to how we integrate. Um, our, our new our new neighbors, uh, it will take significant collaboration from state and city. And I, I want to point out that we someone mentioned earlier, I believe, um, this effort couldn't have happened in Chicago or even like in New York or DC with, without mutual aid, volunteers, philanthropy, community-based organizations. People have stepped up in ways that we never could have imagined. And I think they don't always get the recognition and they should, right? Folks have have found ways not only to provide care, but then to advocate for better systems of care. Um, and, and that is a, I think it is a significant, significant effort that will change how our cities and our states um, operate. And, and then just thinking a little bit more to, to the future, I think that on a federal level, we can, in order to support some of this work, look beyond, um, FEMA funding and other funding for the crisis, but how can our federal government invest in like our 
affordable housing systems in our schools, um, in our in our public health systems, mm -hmm. because we are integrating so many new people. And that is another way to support this effort longer term. Right. Abel, what do you see positive things happening at the local levels? Well, I mean, I think if you if you just turn it around, how amazing would it be for newcomers to get a free bus ride to where they wanted to go? Mm -hmm. And for the welcoming city to have the infrastructure ready to receive them and help them integrate into our society. That would be amazing. I think we would, we would like, we, that's what we all want, right? I, I mean, things have happened for negative reasons, but but some of the outcome has, has been okay. And although we're being overwhelmed in, at, the, at the local cities, uh, the local municipalities. We also have to remember that, you know, immigration may be the realm of the federal government, but people live in cities. It's mm -hmm. where it needs to be resolved. And so I think if people have come together and given their political, their economic context are putting infrastructure to receive them, can it be better? Of course it can, but we are beginning and we're getting stronger in what we're offering in terms of our response. And in the absence of, of the federal government, municipalities are stepping up. Mm -hmm. And I think both in policy, but in real services, because at the end of the day, they are our neighbors. There are their, their kids go to the, the same schools. And so, you know, our, you know, our life is, is entwined together with those newcomers. And it is best to do right by them because at the end of the day, they will do right by us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a lot of positive things that we, we, we can, we can uh, get out of this, including in, in, in the negative ways that it has started. If we just tweak it, I think we can do, and it has moved us, particularly those in, in cities that are outside of the border, to really think what it is to be a sanctuary city, to be a welcoming city, right? Because a lot of those things are, are, are political rhetoric that politicians use uh, to sound good to a, a particular constituency. But really, this is about serving the vulnerable, the newcomer, that in the end will come to strengthen our community. So Miriam, you've been looking at this nationally, the trends in the in the positive way. So give us a quick Yeah, I'll summary. have my cheat sheet here. Um, at last count, 23 states and states that represent more than 80% of the country's foreign born residents um, offered in-state tuition to students regardless of their immigration status in higher education, right? Um, more than 20 states now provide driver's licenses to undocumented residents up from three states a decade ago. And I credit the National Immigration Law Center for helping me to uh, keep track of this, Tanya Broder in particular. Um, some things that happened recently, Arizona voters last year repealed restrictions on higher education for immigrants and adopted in-state tuition for all students who attend high school in the state. And the legislature is considering a proposal this year to offer financial aid. Um, in addition to Illinois, California, and Oregon have expanded public health coverage for most low-income residents, regardless of immigration status. Colorado is subsidizing health care for uh, low-income residents, regardless of status. Several other states are moving in the same direction, like Washington. Um, Utah's governor, Spencer Cox, a Republican who, you know, has been beating the drum in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, signed a law in March um, extending health coverage to low income children, regardless of their immigration status. And during the pandemic, Louisville, Kentucky, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and even some cities in Texas offered a combination of public and private funds to undocumented workers who were ineligible for unemployment or stimulus payments. So there is good news out there. That's great. So this is important to celebrate, know that there's not everything bad happening, but I couldn't conclude this panel without having um, the ultimate expert in federalism tell us <laughs> where we are today. Uh, so this is a fight between federal government and states at some point now it has entered a new chart with states versus states. So, yeah. and people are cognizant we did, uh, about the DACA decision. These are all states taking federal government on its actions. Mm -hmm. So, especially in the Roberts Court, where do you think the Supreme Court today is on the, on the issue of limits of state versus mm -hmm. federal jurisdiction? 
And do you think, as I think Ron Brownstein was suggesting, is that states are trying to dig up some cases to take it back to Supreme Court to undo some of the good things that Supreme Court did a few years ago? Wow, ultimate expert. Crystal ball in the Supreme Court. You're really puffing this one up, Moose. Um, thanks for that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I'll start with that, to be honest, of course. Um, so I, first of all, I, I want to say that I think this is going to keep happening because as people have been saying, um, state and local governments, in, in my experience, are, are often quite practical. There is politics, there is ideology, we see governors running for president and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, the non-federal levels have to balance their budgets, they have to pick up the trash, they have to operate schools and police departments. And the um, those practical realities will continue. And so people of goodwill trying to make sense of those systems are gonna to continue to try to do things that serve their communities, all of their communities. And so I think we're gonna to continue to see experimentation um, that tries to do a better job of the things that cities and states and counties do. I remember when Doris and I 20 years ago went around talking to police uh, officials around the country and I kept expecting to hear, you know, Republican this, Democrat that. And I, I don't mean to say it's non-ideological, but a lot of them were just trying to like get their jobs done. And if a policy helped get their job done, then they would pursue it. And if it didn't, they wouldn't. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of activity. It's true that for some time, the main Supreme Court cases were about preemption, about the um, limits of uh, state and local governments to act contrary to immigration laws. And again, in that fight, the feds always win, right? Federal law is supreme. So the question is, you know, where are the boundaries uh, between what is truly immigration law and what is more state and local activity? And in general, some of the bad stuff at the local level was checked by the courts. Um, I don't think this court is as likely to check the bad stuff. Um, and I'm not sure it's prepared to embrace the more welcoming and inclusive measures. Not sure it's not. Um, and some of these cases you see, I think, at least Roberts and Kavanaugh, becoming impatient with states making up cases and so putting limits on the doctrine of standing, which is about who can complain in court at all. But um, the court, I think, is too often results oriented. And so to the extent that uh, the court just doesn't like the policy. I don't doubt they will find a way to write an opinion that shuts down policies they don't like. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that the recent decisions limiting the standing of states so that it makes it a little bit harder for a state attorney general to run into court and freeze an entire federal policy might chill that a little bit. But I'm not that optimistic that in the big fights, this court would stand with local communities trying to um, uh, welcome all of their residents. But we'll see. Thank you. So we covered all four topics. Uh, so now time for questions. So those of you who want to line up at the mic, please do. Uh, we have promised people that we'll take questions online. And while people are lining up, let me uh, let me read the first of the online question. And it's a provocative one. Sort of what pathways do we have to address the root causes of this busing? Mm -hmm. For example, should we oppose the state policies themselves? Uh, I guess it may suggest that some cities and states are becoming welcoming, like New York State in terms of providing housing. Would that address the issues of, uh, of busing itself? Want to take, start with that? I think the issue of the busing is Governor Abbott has decided to send people on buses. And it, I, the lack of a uh, federal coordination of that I, is, you know, to me, that that is a problem. It's a political problem. Um, immigration, uh, integrating so many numbers of immigrants in such a short period of time has not been a city responsibility. And um, it could be, a, as Abel said, it could be a positive if it had federal coordination and welcoming cities were given the resources to really welcome people and integrate them in, in better ways. So I think it's um it, it's squarely political. We saw the increase in numbers after the announcement of the DNC in Chicago, and we have heard and are expecting to see 
increases in, in buses as we get closer to that date. And so I think at, at one level, that is part of the problem. Yeah. Um, not to mention two flights were sent to Sacramento and only to Sacramento. So yes. I'll tell you something. What, what I would add is that, that, you know, busing is just, you know, it was a political ploy to use, mm -hmm. but that didn't change the fact that immigrants are at the border and coming in. Mm -hmm. um, this also was from the previous policies of Remain in Mexico. So you had sort of an abundance of people waiting, wanting to get in. So, so when that was changed, people started coming in. And then, yes, we, you know, we need to stop in the U.S. just looking at immigrants when they cross the border. We need to have a transnational view of things and understand that what's happening in Venezuela, what's happening in Nicaragua will have eventually impacts for us. And what's happening here with, with our internal labor market. I mean, like, yes. People are, are are seeking freedom and protection, but we have a big walk, help wanted sign out there. And so that there is a, both a push and a pull. So buses are just but a, a, a symptom of that. And I think if we need to address it, we need to start talking about the multiple ways and people need to come in, those that need protection, those that are seeking employment, which we need, uh, and those that want to do family unification. I think it's not one thing that we will solve. It'll be a multiple of, of things. And as much as I would love comprehensive immigration reform, we need to start looking at the smaller bites and see what we can do to move this forward. Uh, great. In-person question here, Mike Wan. Hi. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Sorry. I'm a little short. Um, Terry Givens. I'm a professor at McGill University, but I'm, a, I'm an American. So I've, I've lived in Seattle, Austin, Los Angeles, San Francisco Bay Area, all cities that um, are doing this work. And one of the things I, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Abel for the um, issue of racialization, because I think we overlooked that in the broader policy. And that's actually something I'm working on and will be working on with MPI. Um, I'm also a, a non-resident fellow at MPI. But um, the question I wanna ask, <laughs> yay, is, um, is there an, a potential for governors, you know, lower level officials in states that are doing this work to come together and say, why can't we organize around this and, you know, share best practices? As a, somebody who studied European politics and immigration for many, many years, um, there's the EuroCities project that has been doing a lot to coordinate in the European Union. And I'm wondering, is, is it possible or is just the politics too difficult? I think it's possible, and it is something that we have discussed at the state level as well as at the city level, but the politics do get in the way. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the question, and I, but I do see that as a path forward in many ways, because as has been said repeatedly, especially I think in the earlier panel, um, Congress needs to act in order to create legal pathways for, for people to come here um, in, in more orderly ways with more support. Um, but in lieu of that, it is I, the types of the activities that Illinois is taking and other, there's potential for states to collaborate more. Thank you. Uh, Mike here on the left, please announce, uh, introduce Hi. yourself. Uh, my name is Siobhan Steele. I'm with the Department on Homeland Security, but my questions are on my behalf and not on the behalf of the department. Um, <laughs> just to be very clear, because this is recorded. Um, so I had a quick question regarding opportunities for the federal government, specifically the Department on Homeland Security, to respond to the current immigration system. I know that you had mentioned earlier the possibility of suspending economic sanctions, um, but that was in response to Katrina, which was a, a unique event. And there's nothing quite so unifying in this country as a, a, a disaster. And so I'm curious to know, just given the fact that our immigration system is typically so reactive as opposed to proactive, what are some long-term um, solutions that we could potentially apply to the current immigration system that won't necessarily be impacted by the ongoing legal pushback that we're receiving from all of our legal pathways, such as CHNB, et cetera. And I'm, I'm actually surprised to see that um, the family reunification parole process that you had mentioned previously was not looped into the current lawsuit against CHNB, uh, given their argument. But yes, I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Those... Those of you who don't know, CHNV is Cuban, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans become pollen. So anyone of you want to watch this one? Want to be your... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, and no, let me let me allow panelists to respond. Give you time. Oh, 
I'll, 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 okay, why don't you go I'll, I'll say something. So um, part, um, part of your question was sort of, you know, what can we do that's longer term and that is not subject to the kinds of legal challenges that we're seeing constantly? And I think the answer is nothing. Um, there is nothing that will be immune from legal challenge. Um, there will be legal challenges. So, uh, you know, my hope is DHS will pursue, proceed not in the hope it can find the one thing that's okay enough that no one sues about it, but just assumes there'll be legal challenges and does the thing that seems the right course to follow anyhow. Um, so I hope that it will not be intimidated by the prospect of legal challenge because mm -hmm. they're coming, whether you do something narrow or broad. So... That doesn't mean every legal challenge is equally likely to succeed, of course, so understand why one will take account of the prospects of success, but there's no clear path without lawsuits. And with every lawsuit, there's the possibility it's filed in the, you know, the one judge in Texas who sits in this particular courthouse and will just write an opinion. So if that's the threshold you have to get over to act, you'll never act. So I think you just have to set that aside. Let um Choose the policies that are within your legal authority as you understand it. They will serve the most people and let the lawyers sort out the lawsuits. Um, okay. So I think uh, we didn't discuss FEMA yeah. in this whole panel, which has some relevance. So, so, so FEMA that. provides the, the, the resources. So, so we can't do a lot of this infrastructure building without actual resources, right? So the federal government does have programs in place. We need to look at them, how they're funding. Most of the FEMA funding is for emergency humanitarian aid, and it's kind of short and tenure, but we need to think about they, they have created a new program that extends to 45 days, but that's still not going to be enough. And they need that feedback of saying, okay, what is it what did we actually do? And this will require funding, right? So beyond the policy change that they have in the wheel, wheelbarrow is the fact that we need money to do all this. Nonprofits, even, even the volunteer efforts are not necessarily an absence of funding. And so we need to make sure that the federal government understands and uses every lever possible to provide funding both to the municipalities, but also to nonprofits that are doing the work of integrating immigrants. I would add that we've learned that FEMA is funding um, out migration from San Antonio to Chicago, and people are being given a plane ticket to come to Chicago without a sponsor in Chicago. And then FEMA has given our city and state some funding for us to respond to the crisis. But I, I think that if that is accurate, um, that is something we need to understand better and, um, you know, put it doesn't make sense that FEMA would be paying for people to come to Chicago if they don't have a sponsor. And those numbers have been increasing and increasing. So I think taking a deeper look at at, at what FEMA is funding, it feels almost counterproductive to then um, for us to have to find ways to serve the folks that are coming, especially through O'Hare. Um, and and it just you know it, it doesn't make sense. We would like more increased and more flexible dollars from FEMA in order to be able to respond. Um, and then I think longer term, what I if people are eligible for if they've come through CBP, if they um, already have parole status, we are not we don't have the capacity. Even though we fund legal services both at the city and state level to support folks, we haven't been able to. Um, help identify those those people and move them more quickly to get work authorization. So having the federal government um, send either, you know, staff or fund organizations to do that on the ground, that would be significant and helpful. And then working on the backlog of asylum cases, as well as work authorization cases, would would be something that could be useful as well. So you want to be in like Yeah, just to observe that this discussion of FEMA is exactly why Katrina is potentially an appropriate response. Not every disaster is the same, but we're talking about declarations of emergency, federal and state. You know, Governor Healy in Massachusetts just made a declaration of emergency recently and called out 200 members of the, of the National Guard. These are the kinds of time limited, urgent situations that lead FEMA to act, the National Guard to get called out and in context to suspend the enforcement of laws, which is exactly what the Supreme Court says is the thing you are most immune from legal suit about. Question of the mic two here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Katie Peeler. I'm a, a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital um, and live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so also a very welcoming city. Um, and my question actually is more about the role or appropriateness of institutional civil disobedience. So in the medical world, we've talked a lot about professional civil disobedience, for the abortion bans, but I'm wondering in states like Florida, where you potentially have uh, Medicaid funding being withdrawn if hospitals are not going to report 
things like how much they're spending on undoc undocumented uh, patients, what's the rule for hospitals to say no um, at risk of potentially going out of business um, or banding together as hospital groups? Um, do you have examples of that or how would that work? You know, we're in a business school building, so just curious. <laughs> Mike, you thought your students were pushing down a lot, but uh, this is not legal advice. Uh, uh, however, when hospitals band together, they should attend to antitrust considerations. I'll just say that. So talk to your lawyers about combinations and restraint of trade. Um, but no, I, I certainly don't have the answer. I appreciate the comment. Um, and I know that there are longstanding traditions in medicine under um, medical rules of ethics and professional responsibility, which are different. You know, many professions have their codes, but each code is a little bit different um, that uh, challenge physicians in, in these situations. Um, and I, uh, of course, uh, can't sit here and say, well, this hospital should do this or that should. Do. It's, it's very contextual. Um, but I do think that's the kind of very difficult choice that these policies are pushing people towards. Um, and they go way beyond sound bites into real human lives. And I hope that there are ways to tell the stories, even just of the struggle about what to do. So I hope that physicians and other medical professionals will talk about the stresses they're experiencing. We're seeing that for abortion providers, but this was the Medicaid rules are, are, are all providers, right? It goes far beyond that. Uh, let me uh, ask um, you one question, which come on line, which I think is easy to answer. So let's answer yeah. them quickly so that we could get to all questions. It seems that the states, as states become more aggressive and expanding their role, there'll be more discussion about sanctuary cities. Why has this language been muted or less prominent in the busing discussion? I don't think it has okay. been. The language of sanctuary us, cities. I think you'll be oh. called a sanctuary city. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think it has been either. I think people call us sanctuary cities pretty clearly. <laughs> so I don't think. I think that's the answer. I, I think it started by Governor Abbott saying, "I'm going to send buses to sanctuary mm -hmm. cities." Mm -hmm. They have called themselves sanctuary cities. I'm going to give them a taste of the medicine. That's yeah. My. Uh, so we have an, just one of these overarching questions, <laughs> uh, which I think we are lucky uh, to have uh, a global correspondent here. Uh, the question is, what can we do to help solve root causes of immigration? Any foreign policies we should pay attention to? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have any, uh, any real prescriptions. I would like to make it very clear, if it's not abundantly clear, that COVID changed the world. Mm. It really, really battered the economies of the Western hemisphere. Um, many, many people I meet um, crossing the border um, were doing very well. They were doing fine. Um, the Haitians in Brazil, Venezuelans in Colombia, until COVID decimated those economies. Um, I heard time and again from Haitians that, you know, the value of the money that I was sending my, you know, my family in, in, in Port-au-Prince is, you know, a fourth of what it was, you know, when the Brazilian currency was strong pre-COVID. And so I have no choice. I, I must come to the United States. I need to send the money. Of course, there is the American dream and uh, we can't discard that completely. But in terms of, uh, you know, poverty alleviation, I think that the U.S. government has been trying to um, to expand like this, the H-2A program, which is the agricultural seasonal worker program um, to other countries because it's heavily, um, you know, Mexican um, and South African, um, interestingly enough, um, to do this as a sort of like alternative to coming to the border. But I honestly um, don't know that uh, we're we're succeeding in, in on any front. Um, and I certainly don't know how we can address this. <laughs> so Mike, um, just, I'm sorry. The, I would just uh, like to add that, you know, I think that our economic system to a, a large extent has failed working people and poor people, not just here, but whenever we export it somewhere else. And it's creating a lot of pain. I mean, at, at this moment, there is uh, the largest movement of people in the world. 
right? And people are fleeing men with guns, you know, poverty, all of these things, and and they're shifting, and they're they're trying to kind of find their space in this globalized economy that has been hit by a huge pandemic. And I think the systems are not really ready to take. We have an asylum system that goes back to World War II, but with the re- the new realities of, of criminality uh, are different. And and the fact that immigrants or whenever a national leaves their tor- their territory, they lose all their rights and up to the whims and, and, and stuff. And they become a pariah to that. As bad as the, the, the Darien uh, passage is, I've spoken to the, the mayors of those places and they're like, we don't want immigrants. They've been crying, you know, like the same rhetoric that we hear here, we hear it there. And basically the, the, the immigrants, the invader, the other, and until we change the dynamic and we see that immigrants uh, as a whole historically has made every place they're going better, we're not gonna change the dynamic. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, Mike, I would normally spare you a question, but this came directly <laughs> at you, probably one of your fans. Uh, it says, <laughs> on the issue of standing for states during the Trump administration, blue states also sued over federal immigration policies. Mm-hmm. Could the caution of a state in standing at, at the scourges also affect the potential of blue states to use that route to pose moves in a future Trump administration? Yes, certainly. Uh, I certainly think that it is possible that the Supreme Court is trying to send a message to all the state attorney generals to dial back this business of there's a Republican president, so the blue state AG sue, there's a Democratic president, so the red state AG sue. We'll see. Great. On that back of bipartisan consensus, that we're sending the same message. Help me uh, thank Abel Nunez. Beatrice Ponce de Leon, Miriam Jordan, and Mike Christie. Thank you.